Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're taking a look at the upcoming April 16th Ultimate Fighter Nations finale, which will feature the finals of the, what was supposed to be Australia versus Canada, which is an all-Canadian, both welterweight and middleweight finals, along with a number of good fights. I'll be breaking down five main card fights, plus one preliminary fight, which I wasn't sure would be on the main card or not, uh, in the stout KJ Noons fight. Before we get into that, uh, the, I'm coming off a 5-2 and two event. Again, spoiler alert if you haven't watched uh, the uh, last all, uh, UFC fight night that went down in Abu Dhabi. I went 5-2 and two overall. Didn't do bad. Roy Nelson with a big knockout, which I predicted the, uh, the prop from the knockout. And Clay Guida by upset in the co-main, or by, sorry, the sh- decision in the co-main event. Losing the Andrew Craig upset pick with the uh, that fight being cancelled and the Yaya Bedford fight, which I called to go under, even though I picked Yaya to win. That going to no contest. Both of those cost me a little bit as far as Losing some of my value pick. Either way, I went, did okay at the bet packs. I'll look to do better. This is a very busy week. We've got three fights in nine days and four events in just over two weeks. So I'm going to get right to it. We have six fights here. The rest will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. And let's get into my first prediction of the evening. I'm going to start my predictions taking a look at the headliner of the preliminary portion of the card in the lightweight division between Sam Hands of Stone Stout, 21-9-1, and KJ Noons, 11-6-0. Now, one thing first and foremost, Noons' commitment to his career is a major question mark. He's had some downtime, as you know, not leading up to this fight so much, but still up and down time in his careers. He was considering retirement heading into his last fight, which certainly makes you wonder how... Uh, where, where his head is at coming into this bout. For Sammy Stout, he's alternated wins and losses over his last seven. KJ Noons, conversely, two and five in the same uh, stretch of fights. Now, Noons is a former lead XC champion, one of the top lightweights also to move from Strike Force, but has you know, struggled a little bit going one and one in the UFC so far. Had, didn't look overly fantastic in his last appearance. Stout's a longtime UFC guy, multiple fight of the night uh, awards. Never could put multiple big wins together, though, and that's kind of defined his career, unfortunately, at least up to this point. Uh, both guys are striking base fighters. Noons boxing, Stout more of a kickboxing base. KJ's got eight wins by knockout, Stout nine and one, or sorry, uh, Nine wins by knockout. Only one in the UFC, though, which is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, KJ, one knockout loss, which was the crazy horse uh, Bennett back in the day. Well, Sammy Stout's never been stopped uh, via knockout. He has an excellent chin, and he showed it on many occasions. Now, Nunes' boxing is usually a little bit overvalued as far as I'm concerned, especially going back to the way the strike force guys used to look at it. His strikes landed per minute versus strikes absorbed per minute are very close. He was badly outstruck when he go back to this matchup with George uh, Jorge Masvidal. Uh, in that fight, and it came down to Masvidal's variety and work uh, ethic, and he just outworked KJ in that bout. Noons throws a lot of combos in two and three, twos and threes when he is on. He changes levels nicely, especially going down, starting low, and trying to come up and catch somebody with a rising hook. He will go to the body, and then again, so come upstairs when his opponent drops down to block up. Uh, he uses some head movement and some footwork when he's attacking, but he needs to avoid standing flat-footed and, does, and not admire his work, which he's been guilty of in the past. Uh, he can... Uh, he has been clipped before in the past when he's not uh, focused on his defensive uh, attributes. He wasn't throwing a ton of strikes against uh, George Sotteropoulos, which was a little bit of a concern. He had some trouble with the movement of his opponent, and either he couldn't or didn't choose to close the distance and really appeared frustrated in that bout. Now for Sammy, he seems to have gotten away from a little bit from his technical striking. He's trying to be a little more diverse, a little bit le- less predictable, which you know it's, it's had so-so reviews so far. He likes to throw a nice one too, works his kicks in there very well. He has a very brutal hook to the liver, which can be a very uh, nice weapon for slowing guys down when he lands it. Uh, against Cody McKenzie, who has a history of problems with the body, Sammy was targeting the body several times and looking to land that big shot. Uh, he used the clinch against Fo- uh, Carlos Fodor, which you know was effective in getting that win, and it could be an option against KJ here. He struggled with the hard jab of John McDessie, which is a bit of a red flag for me coming to this boat against a guy like Noons, but he kept coming forward and getting caught with it and really didn't switch up his game plan. Now, both guys have high outputs when they are on their game. Stout has a slight edge and strikes landed per minute. KJ Noons a straight, slight edge and strikes absorbed per minute. But both guys will throw down and expect this to be contested mostly on the feet. Noons has looked good. It hasn't looked good in a long time. Only two wins in his last seven, as I already mentioned. The G-Shots, uh, George Sotteropoulos' victory wasn't overly impressive. And his other victory in the time was against Billy Evangelista back in strike force. And it, too, was very close and not that big of a uh, showing by KJ. Neither guy, though, has looked that great as far as I'm concerned. Stout seems to be trying to advance his career and diversify his skill set a little bit more. Noons has stagnated for a long time now, and he simply tries to box guys up. Stout's going to be at home, which is an advantage. 
or at least in Quebec, he'll be in Canada. The difference for me will be Stout's movement. He throws a little more variety and his volume's a little bit higher, I think. Uh, so my prediction here is Sammy Stout to take a very close decision over KJ Noons. Kicking off the main card portion of the event, we have the number six ranked featherweight on the planet, Dustin the Diamond Poye, 15 3-0, battling in a kind of a surprising pairing, Akira Khorasani, 14-4-1. A lot of people scratching their heads over this matchup. And, for, you know, I understand Khorasani's doing well, but this is a big step up for uh, Khorasani and a step down for Dustin Poirier as far as I'm concerned, where, where both guys are at. Poirier only two losses in his last ten fights, both against ranked opponents in the Korean Zombie and Cub Swanson, which is a fight he took on late notice and would love to get an opportunity to fight him again. Uh, Khorasani... Has uh, has won three in a row, which is pretty impressive. But it was a controversial win over Andy Ogle, which could have gone either way, and a DQ win over Maximo Blanco, in which he got hit with some uh, some strikes. So it's been a very uh, interesting three fight winning streak. Now the uh, Dustin's gonna have a five inch reach advantage, and he's be- very good both on the mat and the feet, which is something to keep in mind here. The guy's a well rounded fighter. He has six wins uh, by knockout, including his TKO win over Diego Brandao, which he's coming off. We also saw him rock Eric Coke on a couple of occasions. Boy, he has a very good chin. He's never been knocked out. He throws solid combinations. He's got a very good kicking game as well. Strikes landed per minute, 4.28 versus 3.08 strikes absorbed. So a nice uh, equation there. You don't want to take that much damage, but still, he's outlanding his opponents. Uh, Corasani overall, 1-3 in, in fights ended by knockout. Plus, he was smashed by Blank when he got rocked by Andy Ogle, so his chin is certainly a major question mark. He has decent hands and, and has some power, despite lacking the big numbers. Uh... The striking exchange rate for him isn't exactly great. He's at a zero, uh, negative point, uh, basically negative one strike per minute uh, differential with his opponents. Now for Poirier, he's he's hittable. He has had issues with that in the past. Brogan's had some success landing. So did Max Holloway when he debuted against Poirier. He landed some shots and forced Dustin to take the fight to the mat. Poirier has struggled uh, in fights when the ground isn't to his advantage when going to the floor with an opponent isn't going to gain him something. That won't be the case here. I anticipate him being the, the better grappler. Now, Akira is a BJJ purple belt. He has three wins by submission, but he averages .99 takedowns at a 33% uh, rate, so not overly impressive there. He had some trouble with Andy Ogle on the mat. He was caught in a bad position and really had no answer for it. For Poirier, a 63% takedown defense, so Akira is not going to be taking him down with relative ease. Uh, Poirier, not great takedown numbers, but he has very slick submissions. He has six submission wins overall, three in the UFC. His one loss, uh, he did lose once to uh, the, lose one submission to the Korean Zombie, which was a very good and back and forth fight, very entertaining. Dustin loves the Darce choke, so watch watch for that one, especially if he gets in a position to lock it up. Poirier, he's developed into a much more durable, and mature fighter over the uh, you know last couple of years. I've been very impressed where he's come from and, and how much he's improved. He's simply too well-rounded for Akira Khorasani in this belt. Akira's proved us wrong before, but I don't think he's going to do it here. Uh, I think Dustin could certainly score the knockout, but my prediction is Dustin Poirier to defeat Akira Khorasani, most likely by submission. We move now to what is going to be the first of two Tough Nations tournament finals, and this one's in the UFC's middleweight division as Canadian Sheldon Westcott, 8-1-0, battles fellow Canuck Elias the Spartan Theodoro, undefeated with a record of 8-0. And as I mentioned, this is Canada versus Canada as the Australians... Uh, get completely shut out of the tournament finals. Uh, Westcott comes into this bout with two first-round submissions, getting him to the championship round. And Theodoro, uh, I believe, had he had a decision and a submission. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I, I believe that's what it was. Now, keep in mind here, Theodoro is a, Theodoro is a natural middleweight. Well, Westcott has fought the most most of his career at 170 pounds. They will be the same height, but that issue, the, you know, it could give Theodore a slight uh, size advantage, but, you know, Westcott is a beast of a man. Both are very aggressive grapplers, and I anticipate look, look for them to look to take the floor, the fight to the floor, or at least clinch it up. There is the possibility their ground game, or their ground games could cancel each other when we get a striking-based fight, but I don't anticipate it the way they've pursued the ground game so heavily in the past. Uh, Theodoro... Uh, overall in his career, three knockouts, two submissions, three decision wins. He has a TKO win in Bellator, so he's been to a bigger show, which is definitely going to be an advantage for him. Westcott, on the other hand, three knockouts, three submissions, and two decisions overall in his career. And and along with a draw versus a very long-serving veteran who's fought a number of high-level guys. That's Thomas Denny. Uh, his only loss was via decision in his pro debut, so he's come past that a long ways. And that's interesting for a fighter to have that, that you know loss it's early in his career so he can get that undefeated pressure of being undefeated off his shoulders and continue on and focus on winning fights and know that he's not invincible and he needs to put in the work. Uh, when, on the show, Elias, for me, he struggled a little bit with Tyler Manowar's uh, defensive grappling, and he looked a little bit... He won the fight, but he wasn't overly impressive in that bout, and I felt that had Manowar done a little bit more to defend, he could have gained an advantage in that bout, because Elias was certainly struggling to get the fight where he wanted to, at least early on. Um, and that's uh, something that you're going to have to watch in this fight. Weight cutting could have played an issue in Elias' struggles. Again, I've talked about much... Uh, 
guys that are natural welterweights fighting as a middleweight on the show to, to make the weight cutting easier. And as I said, uh, Elias is a natural middleweight, so I'll have to keep that in mind too because he could be in better, you know, feeling better overall coming into this matchup. Now, Westcott, he's all forward motion. We saw that on the show. He can create issues uh, if, that, if he struggles to find success early and if he can't get that advantage or if fighters are able to time him and catch him coming forward, that could also be a major problem. Someone can land a shot with the momentum he brings forward. He could go uh, lights out, absolutely. Debut jitters could be an issue for both guys. Elias, he's never lost before, so there's some pressure there. But the Bellator experience, I anticipate him having you know a little bit of edge as far as uh, you know big show experience is concerned. Westcott, from what I've seen, he's a physical monster. And I keep in mind he had neck troubles on the show, which could have been preventing him from re really showing us everything he's capable of. I anticipate he'll be at 100% coming into this bout. And my prediction is... Uh, Short Sheldon Westcott to defeat Elias Theodoro by submission. In our second tournament final of the night, we head down to the welterweight division as undefeated 7-0 Chad the Disciple Laprise battles undefeated 4-0 Olivier Aubin Mercier uh, for the right to win the nation's wel or Tough Nations welterweight tournament championship. As I said again, Canada versus Canada. These guys are teammates. They've trained together, at least on the show, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how that if that plays out at all if either guy holds back I don't anticipate that happening all now both guys are natural lightweights and I already talked about the last prediction got lighter guys fighting in heavier divisions for the show uh, I won't spend any more time on that Olivier he's fighting at home in Quebec he'll be the fan favorite so keep that in mind so we'll have an added boost there Laprise on the show a decision and that brutal knockout of Cajun Johnson which certainly was was vicious to say the least uh, Obama Mercier, a decision and a very impressive submission win in his two outings on uh, the reality show. Uh, both guys have limited pro fights. Seven has seven for Lapriz, but he has two Bellator appearances, which again, uh, like Elias in the last prediction, that will certainly help him dealing with the jitters that could come with a big fight like this one. Olivier only four fights overall, so not a ton of pro action, but I think his uh, overall demeanor will certainly set him up for a good performance here. Olivier four submissions in his career. Uh, Laprise, four knockouts, one submission, and two decisions, accounting for his seven wins. Laprise clearly has knockout power in what we saw in that fight. And Olivier is a ground specialist, so we know where these guys want to take this bout in either situation. Now, Olivier may be a little more one-dimensional as far as that's concerned, but he landed some decent shots in semifinals against Richard Walsh. But he seemed a little bit slow in that fight. I was a little concerned early until he got the bout to the ground. Uh, Laprise, for my money, he wants to keep it standing. And we've already talked about how good Olivier is on the ground, so there's no doubt what he wants to do. Lapri's experience is big, but home advantage will be equally as big as uh, for Obama Mercier. And the debut jitters, again, could play a factor for both guys. Uh, Chad, he's out of the Adrenaline training camp. And even though I love those guys, I've been over there a couple of times and seen the guys, and they've been really good to me as far as the guys I've talked to. I hate to say it, but they've had, you know, it's just the way it is. They've had some trouble, that camp, with grapplers. And they're more striking-based camp, guys like Mark Hominick, Sammy Stout, and uh, Chris Hordecki, for the most part, they're they're more striking based. I think you know Chad Laprise, he might have some decent grappling work, but uh, Olivier is very solid on the ground. And they talked about it. I believe it was Elias kept saying in the house he was able to ragdoll guys who were fighting at middleweight, and that's how strong this dude is. He's very compact. He's very good with his technique, and I think that shows up here. And uh, Mercy, he's very cool and calm, and I think that will carry over. But he, again, he needs to get this fight to the ground and avoid Laprise. I think Chad needs to use a lot of movement, land shots, and keep him backed up. Use that jab, keep him at the end of it. Either way, I think Olivier gets the fight to the ground, and my prediction is Olivier Aubin Mercier to defeat Chad Laprise by submission. In the co-main event of the evening, we have the battle of the coaches in Australia's one representative on the main card, as Patrick the Predator Cote, 28, no represent Canada, will take on Kyle Noak, 26 and 1. Wrestling out of or fighting out of Australia, and this will be taking place at welterweight. And it, both guys are former middleweights, though. So keep that in mind here. Uh, Note comes in with three inches of height and an inch of reach. Uh, here, Noke debuted and quickly KO'd Charlie Brenneman, and unfortunately, or debuted at welterweight. Uh, he hasn't fought since December 2012, which is a year and a half layoff with an injury and then the ultimate fighter taking up his time. Cote won a very controversial win over Bobby Volker in his first fight. Volker did a lot of, had a lot of success in that bout. A lot of people felt he could have easily got the nod. Uh, but Cote, you know, Noke's been off for a year and a half. Cote's been in, out of action for a year as well. Now, Cote on the books, eight wins by knockout. He's known for his power. His one knockout loss came came via injury against Anderson Silva. But his while he does have an iron chin, we saw him. He did get hurt against Alessio Sakara before the illegal blows landed. Bobby Volker rocked him a couple of times. So his chin could be faltering. That could be from a career of standing and trading and banging with guys. That's 27 career fights, to, you know, taking that method. He also, he's 34 years old, so he's getting up in age a little bit. He does throw heat, but he appear, appeared a little tentative against Kung Lee, but let's, who, who are we kidding? Who wouldn't appear uh, tentative in that matchup? Uh, 
for uh, Kyle Noki, 7-1 and one in fights ending by knockout. He was knocked out by Scott Smith back in 2008, which at that point in time was really nothing to be ashamed of. Noke, but Noke has knockout power too. Strikes landed per minute uh, favors Noke at 3.44 versus just 2.51 for Patrick Cote. Strikes absorbed per minute also uh, favoring Noke. 2.85 Cote, that's what he gives up versus 1.77 for Kyle Noke. So Noke, if he can keep those make those numbers show up, that'll favor him big time with the judges or at least the perception of it. Now Patrick's a BJJ brown belt, but he's 3-3 three and three in fights ended by submission. He did attempt multiple subs versus Volker, but he really wasn't close to landing anything. They looked a little bit sloppy. He's had trouble with grapplers in the past. 49% takedown defense. Uh, Volker took him down four times. Even Kung Lee took him down twice. And we saw going back, uh, Tom Lawler had a lot of success putting him on his back with five takedowns and really shot Kote down in that position. Kyle Noak, eight submissions overall in his career, so he's very capable on the ground. He does have two submission losses, including one against Ed Herman in the UFC, but that won't be an issue against Patrick Kote. Uh, his two UFC subs, most notably one coming over Chris Camozzi, which is pretty impressive. Noak has decent wrestling numbers, 2.95 takedowns at 53%. Uh, he had three takedowns against uh, Craig, three takedowns against Kimmins, and he has, you know, he's shown some decent wrestling and some, a decent top game as well. Now, Noak, he needs to avoid taking the big shot from Patrick Cote. That's his number one focus. Use a lot of movement, be more diverse, and simply outwork him on the feet. Takedowns, if he can land them, and I anticipate he will, are going to give Kyle Noak some serious points, and he will take the knockout power out of the equation for Patrick Cote. The layoff is a bit of con concern for the Aussie, but Cote hasn't looked that good in the UFC for a while. The Volker fight against Kung Lee, against the car, going back to Tom Lawler, he had some success out of the the UFC, which got him back into it on short notice. Overall, I haven't been that impressed with Patrick. I think it's going to be a close fight, but I think Noak is going to be a little bit more diverse, and my prediction is Kyle Noak to defeat Patrick Cote by decision. In the main event of the evening, we head to the UFC's middleweight division for a very exciting and promising looking fight as the number five ranked Michael the Count Bisping, 25-5-0, battles the number eighth ranked former Strike Force title challenger Tim Kennedy, 17 4 and 0. Oh. Now, there's some bad blood coming into this belt, but in reality, when isn't there bad blood involved with Michael Bisbings in a fight? And it's nothing new for him, so I don't anticipate that'll rattle him. It could, though, rattle Tim Kennedy, get him a little bit off his game if he's looking, uh, you know. To, you know, looking to go out and take his emotion into the cage. Bisbing's coming off eye surgery and a fairly long layoff right around a year, which is, you know, something always to be taken into consideration, but he is a veteran fighter, so I anticipate he, you know, will be able to manage it. Uh, the count's going to th be three inches taller and an inch and a half of reach on Kennedy, which, you know, certainly can add up as far as length is concerned. Now, Michael Bisbing is a kickboxer with an incredibly improving wrestling game. Well, Tim Kennedy, he's a grappler at base, and he's working to improve his striking. He sh certainly showed in his last fight he has capabilities on the feet. Now, this is a five-round fight. Keep that in mind. And Kennedy has gone five rounds twice with Jacare Souza and uh, Luke Rockhold. He lost them both, but not because of his cardio, simply because his opponents were better than him on that night. And the Jacare fight was very close. Bisbing's never gone five rounds, but he has excellent cardio, and he's shown that time and time again. He's able to use it as a weapon. Kennedy... When you look back, when he fought Robbie Lawler, and that was a very high-paced fight, he slowed against Lawler in the third round, was in a lot of trouble, and Robbie was really taking it to him. I think overall the cardio issue will be an advantage for Michael Bisbing, especially the way he picked up the pace in his last fight against Ellen Belcher as the fight progressed, and Belcher really had no answer for it. And Belcher's a very good striker, and that could be the same in this situation. Bisbing, 14 wins by Naka, which a lot of people would not be able to guess that number if I gave him three guesses. He doesn't have that one-punch power. He does death by accumulation. He throws a lot of volume, 4.62 strikes landed per minute. He simply outworks his opponents at almost a rate of 2-1. to one. For every one strike they land, he lands two, and he keeps putting it on them. He has solid combinations. He works his kicks into his attacks very well, throws a nice switch kick. He will go upstairs. He has some very solid knees as well. Um, in the Belcher fight, he landed Belcher 93-29, to which is a very impressive total. Now, on the flip side of things, Bisbing has lost twice. Two knockouts versus Vitor Belfort and Dan Henderson, the head kick and the H-bomb. But Kennedy doesn't hit that hard, even though it looked like it in his last fight. Those are two big boys, or at least big hitters in Vitor and Henderson that put Bisbing down. But the count, he has been vulnerable to a right hand. He's a little bit chinny, especially if his opponent can, can land an early shot and back him up. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, Tim Kennedy, six wins by knockout. But until Hoffi on the towel went down, his last came in 2007. He landed that big left hand that floored the towel, which was pretty impressive. A leaping, leaping left hook that got in there. Uh... Now, accumulation-wise, Tim Kennedy lands at a rate of approximately uh, not quite two strikes less, less per minute than Michael Bisbing, which is something to keep in mind here if this fight goes does go long. But he limits his opponents to 1.42, which is about one strike less per minute than Bisbing. So keep that in mind as well if Kennedy finds some success shutting down uh, the count's attacks. He will throw some hard leg kicks. He will also go high. And as I said, he has a nice leaping left hook when he throws his combinations. But he tends to throw some singles. 
Now, he did struggle with the more technical striking Luke Rockwell, but he's improved since that fight. But again, against Rafael Natal, I felt he lost the opening round right up until the knockout. He was waiting on Rafael to throw some strikes and landing and, and, and really trying to counter back or at least engage after the original shots were landed. And that's not a good thing against Bisbing. And he tends to fight his chin up a little bit. He's trying to correct it, but as the fight goes, he tends to raise it up, and that's going to be a target for a guy who can put some power on you. Even though, again, I said Bisbing's not known for those one-punch big shots. On the mat, Kennedy, BJJ, Black Belt, eight submission wins, 2.63 takedowns at 37%. Is very good if he can get the fight to the ground, but he has a struggle, struggle with aggressive grapplers in the past. Hodger Gracie took him down twice in the first round. Even Trevor Smith uh, had success putting him on his back uh, three times. But he has a 78% take on defense because he, he's very good at grappling. It's just those guys have had success putting him down. Bisbing... As I said, he's improving his wrestling. Four takedowns versus Brian Stan. He even took Chael Sonnen down. And he gave Sonnen an incredibly difficult time taking that fight to the mat. And he has a 64% takedown defense to show how difficult he is to put on his backside. Bisbing's layoff is a major concern. But it wasn't an injury like a knee or a shoulder. I anticipate that I should be ready to go. And unless uh, Kennedy can put a big, couple big shots on him and maybe test it out and see how far along it is, if it's 100% healed, I don't foresee it being an issue. Kennedy seems to either hesitate to engage or is willingly letting his opponent strike first and looking to find holes, which is not a good thing against a guy like Bisbing, who will just keep coming forward and keep landing shots. Bisbing's going to eat that style up. Bisbing could land some takedowns, but the striking variety he throws, the pace at which he works at, and his cardio will be massive contributors to his success in this fight. So my prediction is Michael the Count Bisbing to defeat Tim Kennedy by decision, possibly late stoppage, but I'm going to go with the consensus here and take Bisbing by decision. So those are my five main card predictions and one preliminary prediction for the upcoming Tough Nations finale. We have a fight this Saturday, a couple days later, so I have to get right on my preliminary predictions for this matchup, for this card, and then move right to the Fox 11 event, which will be fantastic. I'm going to do my best to, to kick out all the information I possibly can and get you guys informed, at least of my opinion. I know I'm uh, frequently wrong, and uh, that's not something I'm concerned about. It's, as long as I do as good a job as I possibly can breaking fights down, but it's, it can be difficult, and I'm not making excuses. It's just a matter of fact. With so much, with you know my other non-MMA-related life and so many cards that Uncle Dana seems to be throwing at us nonstop, I wish he'd slow down just a hair. And this two fights in one day business is going to be absolutely murder. Uh, but either way, it's a lot of MMA. It is fun, and I look forward to breaking stuff down. Kamikaze Overdrive MMA predictions. Thank you as always for listening, folks. I'll talk to you here soon.